All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Carla Marquez Lewis. I am the director for the psychology program at CUNY SPS. We have two different programs. Uh, we have a bachelor's program and we have a master's program. Today, we're gonna be talking about the master's degree program. And tomorrow we actually have an info session about the bachelor's degree program. So if you have anyone that's interested in that program, feel free to um, send them our way. So the CUNY School of Professional Studies um, started in 2003. So we are one of the newer CUNY campuses. There are 25 CUNY campuses and CUNY stands for City University of New York. For those of you who are not familiar, we are the largest urban university system in the United States. And we, SPS, are part of the CUNY Graduate School and University Center. And I mention this just because it's a little bit confusing sometimes. And when students submit their materials, they sometimes submit it and say, I really wanna be part of the Graduate School and University Center. And it's only technically correct. Um, we really are our kind of own school, but we just sit under their umbrella. Um, we are accredited by Middle States Commission on Higher Education. I always note this and I always try, try and stress to all of the people who join our Q&A sessions that no matter what school you end up going to or what kind of research you're doing, schools over the accreditation section website, so that you can make sure that they have accreditation um, because it's very important. One, it tells you that it's a legitimate school, that it's gone through a proper um, outside review of the court, of the uh, materials and the program so that you're sure that you're getting a quality education. Um, it also tells you that that program and the degree from that program is going to be well respected beyond the walls of that program. So if it's not an accredited program, what you often find is if you decide to go to a PhD program, for example, they will not accept any of your credits if the program was not accredited. So you want to make sure that you're going to an accredited school. We are accredited by Middle States, as I mentioned before, which is the highest accrediting body. Um, so in in the in our area, so we are very proud of that. Um, we've gone through extensive vetting process and um, received, um, you know, flying colors, and we're very proud of that. So the CUNY School of Professional Studies, we have lots of master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, dual degree programs, certificate programs, and about 4,000 students at the school. So it's not a small school, but it's one of the smaller schools for CUNY. Um, some of the CUNY campuses have 30,000 students. So, um, you know, we, we say oftentimes that we're small but mighty, but, you know, we're really actually quite large. So I want to just go through kind of the highlights of the program because I want to leave enough time for us to talk at the end and for you to get the questions that you have answered. So our master's program was initially developed because there are wonderful psychology programs around CUNY. We have many uh, graduate programs in psychology, in fact, but there were no fully online programs. And so a lot of students who would otherwise have been wonderful candidates for advanced degrees were not able to pursue those degrees because it didn't fit with their schedule, whether they were working full time, they had children, other responsibilities, they were caregivers to their parents, et cetera. So we are um, really a, a place where people can go who have other things that would prevent them from otherwise attending face to face. So that's really what this program was intended to do is provide more access um, to people to a higher education. So we focus on degree completion and working adults, um, particularly for our undergraduate programs. Um, degree completers means that students are transferring from elsewhere. For our master's program, we really don't have degree completers because people are starting at SPS, but we do have working adults. Um, so most of the people that are in our program are working. Um, now, for that reason, most of our students are part-time and we welcome part-time students. Some master's programs do not welcome part-time students and they do um, require students to be full-time. Um, we do not. As long as a student is taking one class a semester and they're progressing, that's fine um, for us. Our courses are very affordable. They're very flexible. Um, and we're, they're taught by academics and practitioners. And so you really get the best of both worlds that theory and the theoretical framework, but you also get the how-to so that once you go into the workforce that you're able to really hit the ground running. So the degree that students receive from CUNY SPS is a master's in psychology. 
And then noted on their transcript is their concentration. And those two concentrations that we have now, we are currently working on more, but we have industrial organizational psychology, the study of human behavior and organizations in the workplace, and then developmental psychology, which is looking at human growth, whether it's emotional, physical, cognitive, um, social, throughout the entire lifespan. So starting from infancy all the way through um, the death and dying stage. So in terms of who should apply, it really, it really is anyone, but we find our students falling into one of these three categories. So it's people who are already in the field um, in psychology or some related social or behavioral science, and they want to get some advanced knowledge. Um, and so they want to, you know, to advance in their careers. Um, maybe they want to be a director or, you know, some kind of management. We also have people who are in some other career and they want a career in developmental or IO or psychology in general. And so they need the credential for that reason. Um, we have students who are in law, um, economics, accounting, you name it, um, and they really need to move over and a master's degree helps them do that. And then also those students who wish to pursue a PhD at some point in their life um, or a PsyD, they opt to do the master's program first. And there's a reason why people do that. And I just want to mention it quickly. When students want to go to a PhD program or a PsyD program, those are very competitive slots. Uh, we're talking at some schools, probably three or four. Um, my own program, um, there were uh, seven of us. So it's, it's not a, a big selection of people. And so you really have to make yourself as competitive as possible. And admissions committees are looking to see that if you're going to take one of those slots, they want to make sure you're going to finish, that you're going to contribute to the field, um, that you have what it takes to do independent research and complete a dissertation. So for that reason, some students attend a master's program first to make themselves more competitive and show an admissions committee that they can successfully complete graduate work and that they can do independent research. And they show that based on the capstone or thesis project that they complete in our program or any other master's program. So that's the purpose. So we require 12 courses, um, 36 credits. I'll go through these a little more carefully in just a moment. So we have core courses. These are the five core courses we have offer now. Um, we are working on adding more, but students will pick three of these, um, whichever three they want. Then they will move on to research courses. Early in the program, those include statistics and research methods. And then at the end of the program, it's what's called the capstone project planning and then the capstone project. This is a two course sequence. So you take one right before the other and it's a year long project that you're working on. And then in between, you are taking specialization courses. So if you're an IO, you'll take the three up top. If you're on the developmental track, you take the three on the bottom. And then students have electives right now. You know, I think electives is a sort of a loose term. They are, they're in the elective pool, but right now we only offer two in each track. So they're really courses that students have to take. Um, but we are developing more and adding more to our, um, to our offerings. And so we hope to have more very soon. Um, so industrial organizational psychology would be personnel selection and group dynamics and developmental psychology, it would be cognitive development and atypical development. So finally, I, I wanna talk a little bit about career opportunities. Um, I always recommend that what people do is go to uh, some search engine, whether you like monster.com, indeed.com, whatever it happens to be, enter in psychology um, and then you know masters in psychology and then click and see what comes up. You can do the same with IO psychology if that's your area that you're wanting to focus or developmental psychology. And then we, what we want you to see is what career opportunities are available specifically in your area. Now we know that most of our students go on to our human and social services or personnel and training or research and data analysis, but psychology being the wonderful field that has to do with a scientific exploration of human behavior really intersects with anything and everything. Because of that, it's a very common um, degree that people use to apply to 
a wide array of jobs. So anything from marketing to uh, sports to business to cognition, neuroscience, I mean, you name it, it has to do with psychology. And so a master's in psychology, remember you're getting a master's in general psychology, that's really so flexible and so valuable. So do your homework, do those searches. And I think one of the things that you'll see is that you're very surprised at some of the opportunities that are there that you really never thought about. And then once you see them, then it becomes kind of obvious. Oh, of course, um, you know, a career in marketing or some, you know, creative endeavor, of course, that would involve psychology because, you know, we're looking at how people behave. Um, so I would urge you to do that and to jot down some of those career opportunities um, so that you keep them in the back of your head um, going forward. So in terms of admission, we require a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution. You see that accreditation coming up again. We require a personal statement. In this personal statement, I wouldn't write more than two pages. It really should address why you wanna pursue a degree, specifically why us, um, what you're hoping to do with it in the future and why you'd make a good candidate for the program. If you know what your area of interest is, a very specific research interest, you should add that too. Um, we want a copy of your CV or your resume. A CV is really an academic resume. Um, a, a regular resume is just fine. We need two letters of recommendation. These need to be professional or academic only. So they really should not be from friends, family, or cannot be from friends or family um, or lateral colleagues. So if you're both at the same level um, at a job, um, that should not be the person providing the letter. It really needs to be a supervisor who can attest to your abilities. Um, same with an academic letter. It should be an advisor, preferably an instructor um, who can attest to your academic abilities. And then we need transcripts um, indicating a GPA of 3.0 on a four point a scale. This needs to come from every school you've ever attended past high school. And the reason why Oftentimes, uh, the question we get is, well, why can't I just submit the most recent transcript that I have? Because that will encompass all of the information from all of the prior schools. But that's actually not the case. Um, when you receive transcripts, there's a lot of missing information from the other schools besides the school sending it. So if you went to Baruch College and um, you know Pace University, for example, and Baruch would provide us full information of the Baruch information, um, the courses, the grades, et cetera. But from PACE, it might say things like credit applied um, or just CR and no grades. Um, so that's why we need the original transcript from each school. And then we require that students have or applicants have three pre-admission courses. Um, completed before they're allowed to start taking courses in the master's program. So a, a person can be admitted into the program without these completed, but they have to complete them um, before they can start taking master's courses. So one of the questions that we get a lot is, well, why would I apply before? Is there an advantage to applying before I've completed the pre-admission courses or should I wait until I finish the pre-admission courses? Um, the answer is it depends because it, applying now, even if you don't have the pre-admission courses completed, does get you a major advantage. That advantage is that you will get matriculated admission, um, tuition costs. That's cheaper than taking a course as a non-degree student. So you're considered a degree student because you've been accepted conditionally into the master's program. So you can, you can get a better rate um, for those courses. It also gives you some insight into what your courses might be like at the graduate level, um, even though undergraduate courses, of course, are um, require you know, less time, there's a higher level to the master's degree content, et cetera. Now, what's the advantage then to waiting? If you're gonna pay higher tuition, why wouldn't everyone apply? Well, if you don't have a, a very, very solid um, application and you're kind of on the fence, if you have those three pre-admission courses completed with strong grades, that could tip you over into the positive course or the positive side of things. So it may be that if you don't have these um, completed, we may either deny you um, or, or we might say, you know, we're gonna have to deny you now, come back later after you've finished these courses and, and then, you know, reapply. Um, but if you have a strong application to begin with and you just are missing these classes, 
when I say strong application, I mean, your grade point average is good. Your personal statement is strong. Um, your letters of recommendation are good. Then I wouldn't worry too much about having these completed. You can complete them once you enter. So a couple frequently asked questions, and then I wanna to move to your questions. I see there's some already accumulating in the Q&A section. What if I wasn't a psychology major? This is a quick and easy one, no problem. Um, why we require those three pre-admission courses, they're undergraduate level courses. It's because it will help kind of even out the playing field a little from people who are psychology majors who are going into this program. So you'll have at least some basic, base level uh, foundational information about psychology through an intro class, a uh, research methods class and a, a statistics class that will help you um, when you go into the master's program. Um, will this program prepare me for licensure? Um, if you look on our website, we make, there's a notation there that we do not prepare students for licensure. This is not a program that readies anyone to be a counselor um, or go into clinical work, not with just this degree. You would have to go on to additional um, clinical work. We don't do anything related to that. That's not the type of program we are. However, if you wanted to get a PhD in clinical psychology, you could certainly go through this program and then get that training there. How long will it take me to finish the program? That's really up to you. 12 classes. If you take one a, a semester, it's going to take a lot longer than obviously if you take two a semester or three a semester. Most of our students take two or three a semester. So it takes them about three years um, to get through the program. Um, the shortest amount of time someone can get through the program is four semesters. And that has to do with the sequencing. Statistics has to be taken um, before you can take research methods. Both of those courses have to be taken before you can take the first class in this capstone sequence. And then the first capstone class has to be taken before you can take the second capstone class. So that's one, two, three, four semesters. And then how, how can I transfer courses to the new degree program? If you were in a master's program, specifically if it was a psychology master's program prior to this, it's possible that maybe one or two classes could transfer. We don't transfer any more than two classes. Um, we expect students, if they're getting a degree from us, they're taking you know, our classes and we can control the quality of those courses, um, but it has to be a perfect match. So if someone has taken a research methods class, we would look at the syllabi, match it. And if it matched our content, we would give someone credit for that. Um, but again, we'll take only up to two classes, um, six credits max. Um, how does online learning work? I'll come back to that um, in just a moment. And then are there scholarships? Um, yes, there are scholarships. Feel free to look at our financial aid page. And I think um, Darian is going to post that or has posted it in our chat. Um, so you can take a look there and see the information about tuition, any financial aid and scholarships and see which ones you might qualify for. So let me go to your Q&A, and usually something comes up about how online learning works. If it doesn't, I'll come back to that and answer that question. All right, so the first question, what grade do you will do we have to be to apply to enroll? Um, so in terms of the grades for the pre-admission courses, maybe if that's what you're asking, um, in terms of pre-admission courses, students must complete those pre-admission courses with a B or better. If they don't uh, complete it with a B or better, we don't allow them to take it a second time to tr sort of try again. They're dismissed from the program. So it's really important that they get that B. Um, if a student cannot acquire a B from those undergrad program um, courses, it's gonna be a tough go um, when someone has to go to higher level courses in the master's program. We require a 3.0 grade point average to graduate, which is a B or better in all of your classes. So. If someone can't isn't acquiring a B or better in an undergraduate class, it's it's unlikely they would be successful in the master's program, and that's why we 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 would dismiss them from the program. Um, how recent do the pre-admission courses need to be? Uh, great question, Lauren. We do not have a cap on years. Um, what I would say though is if it's been more than ten years, or if you've forgotten a lot of the content, I would probably think about retaking it maybe with on your own through like Coursera or something like that, just to refresh your 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 memory. Because remember the first two courses or the first series of courses are your core courses, but right after that you go into advanced research methods and advanced statistics. So if you don't really remember anything from your undergrad statistics classes or your undergrad research methods classes, you know, it's going to be really tough, um, you know, those that level of coursework. Um, if we apply now, how long does it take to be accepted? Great question. Um, we have two 
dates. Um, April 6th is our priority date. If you apply by the priority date, um, it's about three to four weeks. Um, if you apply on the regular date, which is May 18th, it's a little longer um, than the four weeks. It's usually around four to six weeks. Um, so we try to get the priority decisions out really quickly afterward. And so our admissions committee meets pretty regularly. Where do we access the pre-admission courses or is this required to have been completed during the completion of the? So if someone was a, a psychology major, it's a 99% chance that you've already taken all three of the classes. Um, if someone isn't a psychology major, they probably might have taken intro to psych um, but maybe would be lacking the research methods and statistics courses because these aren't just general research methods or statistics classes. They're specifically psychology research methods and psychology statistics. So those um, you could look on if you wanted to take them with us, you could certainly do that. We offer them in the spring, although the spring semester's already started, um, but we offer them in the summer. Um, so someone could take, you know, uh, those classes then. Keep in mind though that intro to psych is a prerequisite for the research methods and statistics classes. So if you don't have all three, you could take one in the summer, but then you'd have to take the other two um, during the regular semester. Um, let's see, what other, let me see. I think there's a couple more. Um, what if our undergraduate transcript is 20 years old in, different majors and we have work experience in that entire time is the transcript still a huge piece. The transcript is everything. I mean, the if someone has, um, now I, I will say this and it's really important. We look at people as a whole, right? So that's why we ask for the letters of recommendation, the transcript, the personal statement, et cetera. But ultimately how someone did in their undergraduate work is, is the evidence that we have of how they'll do now that doesn't mean that it's a direct correlation, right? I mean, it's possible someone like you know has been out 20 years and they're a different person and maybe they were in a major pre-med that just didn't work for them. And now they're coming back and they wanna go on to the master's program. If you have a GPA that's lower than 3.0 and like significantly lower 2.6, 2.5, even 2.7, I would actually recommend taking a couple of psychology classes in the, an undergraduate class as a non-degree student and applying afterward because with a 2.6, even if it's been 20 years and you're a, a new person, we don't have any evidence of how you'll do in our classes. So we, we really need some fresh evidence. Um, so that's why I would re re recommend taking some classes um, so we could see, oh, okay. So the student has a 2.6, but they took a, you know, a handful or a few classes in psychology and they got A's in them. So maybe they really are a different person. They're more mature. They're better able to succeed in our program. Um, so that's the kind of, of thing you'd want to do to kind of sort of mediate um, mediate any past negatives on your um, and your admissions application. Where do I submit my letters of recommendation? So you don't submit the letters of recommendation, your recommenders submit them. So um, when you start applying, you would enter in the information for the person. Um, and then they would they would write your letter of recommendation and then they will attach it um, and send it in. Um, so that would be the best way. It is possible for people to get a letter of recommendation from someone sealed, signed over the, the envelope, but that's really kind of an outdated way to do things. And we don't really do that anymore. So electronic is best. Um, I completed the early education bachelor's program at City College. Would this online master's program be valid for the master's degree that I am required to obtain my initial teaching cert into a permanent one? Um, you would have to talk to them. We don't have anything to do with the educational psych program. Um, so whether or not they'd accept your credentials from, I am assuming you're talking about the developmental track, you'd really have to check with them. Um, we couldn't say, and I'd hate to give you the wrong information. Um, do you have summer semesters or fall and spring only? Great question. Um, we have fall and spring are the guaranteed semesters. Um, summer, we do offer select courses, very few. Um, and I'll be honest, oftentimes they're canceled if they have low registration. So it's really up to students um, to determine whether or not those courses are going to actually run. It depends on who who registers. Um, in the regular semester, that can happen too, but it's less likely um, because more students are interested in taking courses in fall and spring versus summer. Um, the class that does always seem to run in the summer and 
almost never gets canceled is statistics. And sometimes people like to take that class by itself in the summer for obvious reasons, right? It's an intense class. Um, and so that tends to be one that, that people opt to do in the summer. Is there credit for already working in a related field? No, um, we don't have credit for prior learning um, in the master's program. It's something in the, the um, undergrad programs that's offered, but not at the graduate level because there's so few classes to take. There's only 12, it's 36 credits. In a bachelor's program, there's 120. So you can use some of those credits, um, but in a, a master's program, it, um, it's not. Um, can you tell me the ratio of applicants to those accepted into the program? Oh, it, it depends and I'll be honest, you know, when we look at, um, I think things are a little bit tainted, so I don't want to share any information. The reason I say that is because this program started in 2016, and uh, three and a half years later, we entered into a pandemic. So three and a half years statistically isn't enough to look at a pattern um, of acceptance rates. And then you had a uh, a very unusual event that's lasted three years now. So that has tainted and biased the data. So we really don't have solid data that I would be able to share with you. Um, what I would say is that one of the things that we, I think one of the things that usually students are asking is about um, acceptance rates is how likely their chances are of getting in. And it's a fair question when you're looking at programs where there's seats requirements, because if you're doing an in-person program and you only have so many seats, you, you can only accept so many people. We are an online program, so we don't have that. So we don't look at uh, acceptance rate per se, as in we only take 50%. It depends on how many students are quality students that year. If 100% of the students that apply to the program have great grades, um, have strong letters of recommendation, look like promising students, we'll accept them all. If only 50%, then we might only accept 50%, et cetera. So we're not bound by the walls of, or the rules of chairs. Um, so we can accept as many students as, um, as are qualified. So I hope that helps at least a little. Let's see. Do we have to go through a test? Ah, great question. Usually people are referring to the GRE. I think that's maybe what you're referring to Doha. If so, we do not require the GRE um, for a lot of reasons, but the GRE has been, uh, well, research uh, supports that the, the GRE is not the best indicator of how successful someone will be in graduate studies. So we don't rely on the, the GRE. Um, can I start applying now, but start in spring 2024 or wait till next year to do it? So I would wait. Um, there's no advantage to applying now um, because then you just have to defer. And if you're a conditional admit student, you can't defer anyway. So you would just have to reapply. So I would recommend just applying right before you intend to start. Um, how many people each year choose to go on to complete a PhD? Are you asking how many of our students are accepted into PhD programs or how many apply? Um, I think those are two different questions. Um, like I said, some programs take one person, um, some programs take up to seven or eight, maybe max 10. Um, so, you know, students apply, but it doesn't mean that someone's going to get in. And it's actually fairly common for people to have to apply to, you know, quite a few schools to get into one or two, um, or to have to apply more than one year to do so. Um, can we take the required classes as a non-matriculated student through CUNY? Yes, yes. I'm assuming you're talking about the pre-admission courses. If you're talking about the courses in the program, um, they need to be taken in, in our program. Um, occasionally we do allow someone to take an e-permit as an e-permit, which means you, you get a permit, a special permission to take that class in another master's program at CUNY, um, another ma psych master's program, but it would have to, we have to sign off on that and there would have to be extenuating circumstances. For example, you're, you were the only person that was meant to take that class that semester and the class got canceled. Um, because we couldn't run a course with one student. And so we give you permission to take it at, you know, city college or something like that. And that has happened. Um, we can do that. Um, will you have access to these slides? Um, yes, you will have access to these slides. Um, 
You wouldn't be able to take the license exam after receiving this degree. No, this is not a, a, a degree that has anything to do with clinical psych or, or anything to do with counseling. If you're interested in a counseling psychology program, um, you're probably looking for a mental health counseling program or just a counseling psychology program. That Those are the, the key terms you wanna be searching for, which are totally different types of programs. Um, I'm a junior at John Jay, can I apply now? Um, we would not accept a junior. Um, we do accept seniors who are graduating that semester, um, but we, we wouldn't take a, a, a junior. And so I would wait another year. You're probably also missing a lot of coursework we'd be looking for too. Um, so when we review applications, if someone has you know 12 credits in progress, oftentimes we'll just wait. We'll have to wait until those courses are, are done uh, to render the decision if they're kind of on the fence. So, but when someone's a junior, they have way more than 12 courses that still need to uh, happen. So we, we wouldn't have enough. We just have to shelve the application. So I just recommend waiting a little bit longer. Are there any master's programs at other schools that provide licensure? Tons, tons. Um, if you're interested in a, in a program that's going to uh, prepare you for licensure, you'd want to, again, look for masters in, um, in health counseling, MHC programs, or counseling psychology programs. Those, um, there are plenty of them around CUNY, and um, those would prepare you for licensure. Those are clinical or counseling psychology programs, and that's what they're there for, um, is to, to help uh, prepare students for, for careers in counseling and, um, and licensure. Um, someone asked about whether there's a time limit to do the program. Um, someone needs to be taking at least one class a semester and you're only allowed uh, two semesters of a leave. So if you do the math on that, it can't take someone longer than I think it's six and a half to seven years uh, to complete the program. Um, but so plenty of time. Um, do you need to apply right after a bachelor's degree is obtained? Um, there can be a year gap. Oh yes, there can be a year gap. Oh, I see what you're asking. Is there a time limit that you have to do the program right after your bachelor's degree? No, we have people who have been out of school for 15, 20 years and then decided to come back and do a career change. And that's perfectly fine. Um, do you need job experience before applying? Um, no, you don't. Um, does CUNY have an MA in psychology that has in-person learning? Oh, we have tons of them and they're wonderful programs all across CUNY. Um, so again, we have 25 uh, campuses. Um, so if you go to cuny.org, you'll see a list of all of the schools and it'll have the senior colleges. Look there. Um, you can also look at the Graduate Center and it will have all of the master's and PhD level programs. And it'll tell you which types of programs there are, um, but they have in-person learning. Um, and, and there's, again, CUNY has some of the best psychology programs. So you're in good hands no matter where you go. Is it necessary for one of the recommendation letters to be from someone in an academic setting or can they both be from a supervisor? Uh, great question, Jordan. They can both be from a supervisor. That's fine. Especially when people have been out of school for a while, it's, you know, they, they don't have any access any longer to their professors or maybe their professors have moved on to other places and they can't find them or they were quiet in school and, you know, maybe their professors don't um, remember them. That's fine too. Um, yeah, so if they're both uh, professional in nature, that's perfectly fine. Um, are grades from most recent transcripts given them more weight? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, no, uh, it depends. So I, I'd hate to say yes, meaning that none of your other stuff will matter, that we'll only look at, we look at the whole thing. Um, if someone had a really, you know, you know, great, their grades were not the best. And then 20 years later, they decided to come back and complete, you know, finish a degree that they started. And so, you know, the 20 years ago, two years, you know, lots of questionable grades. And then the most recent uh, two years are amazing grades. Yeah, we would definitely take that into consideration. Um, but I can't say that we would give more weight necessarily to it. It, it really depends on the circumstances. Um, we have access to the recording. Yes, yes. 
Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I get everyone's questions. Um, Me just one moment. I'm trying to scroll down to the bottom. It keeps putting me back up to the top. So I'll give you just a second. You know, the furthest one on the bottom that I see is the the recording after the session is done. I think. So maybe that's it. Yeah, those are the last two. Uh, our grades from recent transcripts given um, a a little more weight. Okay. I believe you answered that one, and then the recording. Those, yeah, those are the last two I see. Okay, great. Um, so let me just check the chat real quick. Sometimes people put questions there. It looks like there's none there. So hopefully I've had a chance to answer all of your questions. I want to go back just a couple of uh, slides. Um, if you decide that you want to apply to this program, and again, do your research because um, you know I'm not here to sell you on the master's program at CUNY SBS. I'm here to provide information. This program isn't for everyone. And for some people, another program in another CUNY campus will be better for them. For some people, they'll find a better fit outside of CUNY and that's all fine. It's most important that you find a place that is a good fit for you, that is a program that's gonna prepare you for what you wanna do um, in the future. And so it's important to do a lot of research. Um, I would also recommend applying to more than one school to increase your chances um, of going somewhere uh, so that you don't have to wait another year. But if you do decide that you want to apply to a master's program um, at SPS, we have a priority application date of April 6th, and then we have our regular application due date of May 18th. So the last day you can apply is May 18th, but I would encourage you to apply earlier if you can, because then you find out earlier and you can start planning accordingly. We have an orientation that's mandatory that takes place in August, the uh, week before classes start, it gives you an opportunity to meet um, some of your professors, to meet each other, um, and all of the people who are uh, admitted into the program, and to get acclimated into an online setting, um, how online courses work, et cetera, how to do certain things. Um, so that's something that you should mark your calendar for. It's in the admissions letter. So if you are admitted to the program, it will be there. Um, the last thing I want to say is what it's like to be in an online environment, because I said I'd circle back to that. Um, many of our students say that they were afraid that they'd feel isolated uh, working in an online environment, that they would feel like they weren't part of a class, um, that they were working on their own. That really is kind of the very old, old model of online learning where people felt like they were working kind of on their own. Um, in nowadays, it's much different. It really does feel like you're in a classroom. You're just, you know, happen to be online at different times, but you're responding to each other. You're in discussions with one another. People use voice thread in some classes where you actually record your voice um, and say what you have to say. And then other people respond to it. Your professor is there um, in the course, um, asking questions, talking with you once a week. Um, the professor's live for an hour. You can just log in. You don't have to make an appointment. Usually you just click on a link and the professor's sitting there. You can talk to them about whatever you need to talk to them about with the class. Um, everyone's operating on the same the same material and content for that week. Um, you know, you have a syllabus like you would in any class. You're all working on the same assignments that week. Then you switch to the next week and so on, just like you would in a face-to-face -face class. And so our students do get to know each other really well. They become friends. They have study groups, et cetera. Um, in some classes, uh, especially the capstone later classes, you have biweekly phone calls with your instructor and your advisor. So, you know, they get to work with their, their advisors and other faculty. And you really do feel, at least the students say, you feel like you're in an in-person class. It's just taking place in an online environment. So I hope that helps a little. And if you have any more questions about that, or if you think about anything afterward, um, please feel free to email me. Uh, the email address is at the top, psychology at sps.cuny.edu. And one of the three of us will answer either myself um, as the director, Dr. Alicia as the associate director, or Ms. Isaac as the academic program specialist. And with that, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I wish you the very best in deciding which program. If we could be of any more help, please let us know. Have a great day. Well, I think there's one more question. I think right oh. at the end. I'm sorry. 
That's okay. It's okay. Um, Let me grab it. Maybe I just missed it. Are we able to still acquire that alone solo learning? Not that the... Um, what does it say? I'm sorry. I'm sure. Um, are we able to still acquire that alone solo learning and education without relying on other student answers or replying to other students? Or does the entire program follow the classroom feel you're no. describing? Sorry. It it all requires it, it all follows that you a, a student cannot succeed in this program without interacting with their fellow classmates and their faculty members. It it's um that's the whole model of the program. Um so yeah, it would this wouldn't be a great this wouldn't be a great fit for someone that wants that kind of kind of uh, solo experience. Um this wouldn't be a great program for that. Thank you all. Take care, have a great day.